The second thing is the potential harms of consuming organ meats. Okay. Organ meats are concentrated sources of some of these nutrients, and some of them that have upper tolerable levels that we want to stay below. So one of those is preformed vitamin A, which an excessive intake in pregnancy has been linked to birth defects. So that's one of the nutrients that all of the major health organizations are like, don't get too much preformed vitamin A during pregnancy. Mm. So that's retinol, that's the kind that's found in animal foods. The other source of vitamin A is carotenoids, which is found in plant foods, which there is not an upper tolerable level for because our body excretes any excess. We can meet all of our vitamin A needs with plant foods and if we consume a lot of it, no harm, no foul, we get rid of it. Let's look at sort of where we currently are and where are sort of maybe some small changes we can start with and then sort of build from there. Taking really manageable steps for overall health and we keep sort of harping on too. Yes, we're talking specifically about fertility, but so many of these things are also the same when it comes to pregnancy, when it comes to overall optimal diet to reduce risk of chronic disease. When I'm counseling a client, I like to try to get them away from focusing on quantitative measures of health and yeah. really focus on qualitative mm. and specifically what we want to add to the diet. How can I add more of these beneficial fats that I know are going to be helpful for improving my fertility chances or improving my pregnancy? Like, How can I get more avocados in my diet? Where can I add more nuts and seeds from this perspective of abundance versus a perspective of what needs to be limited? Yeah. That was Whitney English and Alex Caspero from Plant Based Juniors, two pediatric dietitian nutritionists, best selling authors, and mothers who are passionate about helping parents and kids get more plants on their plates. Their books are The Predominantly Plant Based Pregnancy Guide and The Plant Based Baby and Toddler, The Complete Feeding Guide for Infants and Toddlers. Their message is focused on healthy pregnancy, baby led weaning, and raising healthy kids, and relies on evidence based nutrition for their recommendations, giving advice based on research, not dogma. With so many decisions that come with figuring out how to nourish yourself and your children, Whitney and Alex help clear the mud with evidence-based nutrition advice to help others feel confident in their choices. Plant-Based Juniors also recently launched the Learning Center with Dr. Reshma Shah as a platform for healthcare providers and parents to learn more about pediatric nutrition. Their flagship course, Pediatric Nutrition for Healthcare Professionals, just launched and is approved for 35 continuing education credits for doctors, dietitians, nurses, and other healthcare professionals. So check that out linked below if you're interested. If you've been around my channel for a while, you know that I love any conversation around pregnancy and optimal nutrition. So I was excited to sit down with these two and discuss the facts and also the misleading information that's often circulating in the health world right now. In this episode, we dive into the best dietary pattern for fertility and pregnancy, if fertility issues are on the rise and what to do about it, key nutrients of focus during pregnancy and plant-based considerations, the trend to consume organ meats while pregnant, their thoughts on ancestral diets, and if there's a one-size-fits-all diet for everyone, hormonal birth control, iron deficiency, placenta health, and so much more. This episode is packed with information and I honestly could have gone on and on with them. They are a wealth of knowledge and we had so much fun going back and forth. So welcome to the Ellen Fisher podcast. Let's get into it. I love supporting Anima Mundi Herbals, which is my favorite apothecary that carries organic, wild-crafted, and ethically grown botanicals. From elderberry syrup and adaptogenic mushrooms to spirulina, chocolate protein, teas, and collagen booster powders. They are a super special company that uses fair trade practices beyond organic farming, education, and small farmers to create remedies that benefit people from all walks of life. Lately, I've been obsessed with their chocolate protein superfood powder that I add to my morning smoothies after a workout. It's designed using a blend of mostly South American roots and seeds traditionally used for energy, strength, stamina, and resilience. This chocolate protein is a wonderful addition to your smoothies, or you can even add it to your favorite baked goods like muffins. It's formulated with pea protein, rice protein, and pumpkin seed protein, and it tastes amazing. It's adaptogenic, energizing, and nutrient-dense, rich in plant-based protein, prebiotic-rich, and may help regulate blood sugar and assist in treating adrenal fatigue. You guys have to try this yummy plant protein powder, and they also have so many other remedies on their site which are formulated formulated for beauty, immunity, mood elevation, stress relief, sleep, body, and spirit. And I find them to be the perfect addition to my healthy daily routines for my body inside and out. So use my code Ellen20 for 20% off. Just click the link in my show notes to get this deal. Welcome to the podcast, Whitney and Alex. I am so happy to have you here. And it sounds like you've had a great trip so far. You guys are such adventurous. <laughs> what Thank have you, you done for having so far? us. Yeah, yeah we've had a blast. Well, we started off with a sunny day in Wailea because it was a little mm -hmm. bit stormy over here. Um, and we did then yoga. We did yoga. An yeah. amazing yoga class. 
Uh, in a hike, you're like, I hiked a little. Like, oh, yeah, you want to hike? Yeah. And we did a yoga class. It's like you're getting all the things in. We've yeah. been hopping all over yeah. the island. Yeah. You know, we're just soaking up as much as Mount has to offer. Uh, Have you guys ever gorgeous. done the Enneagram test, like personality type test? Uh-uh. It's a different type of. Yeah, actually, I, I feel think like my husband's done it, but I don't remember what I am. Well, it's really interesting because you guys sound like you'd be adventurous just how much you're like doing in these act few days that you're here. I we definitely we like to maximize yeah. our vacations. Things. So, our work vacation. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so can you just explain a little bit for those who are new to you guys and what you do, what is it that you guys do? What's your expertise and your background? Yeah. So we are both uh, registered dietitian nutritionist. We really came together. Well, let's see. I had just had my son. Uh, Whitney was pregnant with her son. We had actually met at a conference, gosh, about like 13 years ago now. Liked each other instantly, became <laughs> friends, sort of talked throughout social media, uh, the internet, et cetera. And then we were really sort of, you know, passing studies back and forth about plant-based diets during pregnancy, during, you know, early childhood, and sort of felt like, you know, there really wasn't uh, a space where dietitians were sharing this information. And so we decided to come together in 2018 mm-hmm. and start Plant-Based Juniors. And our, our mission, our ethos is really this idea that we want all kids to be eating more plants. When we look at survey data, we know that the vast majority of kids are not consuming enough fruits, enough vegetables, enough plant-based proteins, you know, enough whole grains, and really sort of getting everything everyone to shift the diet, not only for human health, but really planetary health and sort of trying to get as many people on board. And I feel like this sort of like age of pediatrics, not a lot of people are talking about plant-based diets and we really wanted to help fill the gap. So that's how Plant-Based Juniors came to be. Our succinct mission is to help more parents get more plants on the plate. Awesome. <laughs> and a lot of what you guys talk about is also fertility that's and right. pregnancy. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Yeah. So what is the best diet for fertility? What does the research say? Yeah, the, the research is pretty overwhelming uh, when it comes to consistent dietary patterns uh, that are best for, for fertility. And that really is a Mediterranean type of dietary pattern. So that can look like a lot of different variations. That can be a plant exclusive diet. That can be a plant predominant diet. Uh, that can be even a pescatarian diet. But really, it's a diet that's centered around fruits, vegetables, legumes, whole grains, nuts, unsaturated fatty acids, um, and really consuming more protein from plant-based sources versus animal sources. Anything for you to say? Yeah, and definitely. I think um, while we don't have a lot of interventional studies on specific diets, we do have a very consistent body of research that is showing these associations. So there was one study out of Harvard of over 17,000 women. And the closer they adhered to this so-called pro-fertility diet, which as Alex described, is high in unrefined carbohydrates, fiber-rich carbohydrates, uh, plant-based protein Mm -hmm. versus animal protein, and then unsaturated fatty acids. The women that most closely adhered to this dietary pattern had a 66% reduced risk of infertility. So that's amazing. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's pretty clear yeah, it's, in, it's, in the evidence. Yeah. Uh, one thing I was going to say too about that specific study is that they also found that women had a higher chance of fertility when they consumed iron from either plant-based sources, so non-heme sources, or from supplements, which I think sometimes, you know, we don't hear enough of the benefit about plant-based iron, but that study specifically showed a higher benefit in fertility with those sources versus animal-based iron. And is there even enough research, though, to give a confident answer? I think there's definitely enough to say this is the dietary pattern that we know is associated with not only improved fertility, also pregnancy. I mean, this is sort of the same dietary pattern. It doesn't change really throughout the lifespan. I mean, this is really the consistent, uh, the consistent patterns that we see are, are the most beneficial. There's some nuance, um, of course, and sort of like where that, that plant predominancy to, to plant exclusive line lies. But for the most part, I mean, I think I think any any arguments to the contrary or any arguments against that type of dietary pattern really isn't evidence-based. Okay. Has there been a rise in fertility issues? It seems like there has yeah. been. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that's definitely sort of where 
um, headlines have led. And, and I think there's a lot of things to sort of unpack and consider. The first thing is that there definitely has been an increased time to conception. So what that means is, you know, we define infertility as actively trying during your active time of the month. Uh, for 12 months for women under 35, and then that shortens to six months for women over 35. So, you know, if you're trying to get pregnant, that's a really long time to be wanting a baby and, you know, not getting pregnant and not considered to be um, infertile or having that diagnosis of infertility. And then the other thing is too, is that, you know, fertility has really become more medicalized in the last few decades. You know, we, IVF, IUI, various medications, these are all recent technologies. And so we're also seeing increased numbers of being able to track women who want to use these these technologies. So, you know, yes, there is a slight increase in increased time to conception, but that also has to do with other factors that come into to being pregnant. Yeah, um, like what factors? Age is a big one. Mm-hmm. You know, I think our, our culture has shifted a lot. Mm. Um, most of us, women especially, are becoming uh, more educated which tends to shift sort of the timeline from wanting to have children. And yeah. the biggest risk factor in infertility, unfortunately, is age. So, you know, when you're trying to settle down and become pregnant and you're 36, you know, in, in baby making years, you're you're a gestational, I mean, you're a geriatric pregnancy, you know, like yeah. it, it's, those are- Which other, I don't love that term. No, and I, and I had that label too. Yeah. No, no, my doctor kept, or my, my midwife kept referring to me as like a geriatric pregnancy and I was like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> enough you is know, enough. You know, I'm no spring chicken, yeah. but come on. It's true. People are waiting longer yeah. to, till they're ready to have kids. They want to accomplish different things mm-hmm. first, or like you said, they're maybe getting educated and then they want to use that education towards a career sure. or a job before they want to have kids where a long time ago, our grandparents were having kids a lot younger. Yeah. Right? And, and, and more people are, like Alex said, kind of to sum it up, is more people are seeking help mm. for, for fertility. Mm. So, of course, we're going to see these numbers. And oh, we have more yeah. options. Yeah, no, that makes sense Like too. we didn't have all of these uh, reproductive technologies uh, several decades ago. Right. Or people weren't using them as frequently. Mm-hmm. So that's one measure of infertility rates. Mm-hmm. So it can seem like we have this, you know, fertility crisis, Mm -hmm. but it's, yeah, we're measuring the cases more. And there are some, you know, suboptimal sort of considerations, lifestyle, age, you know, stress is a big one too. And, you know, again, with women taking on sort of more responsibility than maybe they used to a few generations ago, all of those factors can influence fertility. That's really interesting. All of that makes sense. It's really hard to say if it actually is on the rise or if it's the way we're measuring it or if it's the fact that our population is just more unhealthy generally. Totally. Having babies later, just complex. (laughs) What about about hormonal birth control? Do you think that could affect fertility? It It seems to me like the general, I don't know, what you hear is like, nope, it's perfectly healthy, perfectly safe. Anyone who says otherwise is quackery is kind of what you hear. Yeah. But every single person I know who's taken hormonal birth control had really mm. not fun effects, yeah. did not feel good, or potentially maybe could be correlating issues with fertility down the road. Yeah. Obviously on their own anecdotal experience, not really sure if that's connected, but it seems to be like a very common theme, yet in the medical world, no one wants to acknowledge it, and it's very bizarre to me. Yeah. Well, what we'll you give think? you the evidence base yeah, okay. answer. Tell me what the evidence says. It's I'm like anything. <laughs> you know, the anecdotes are the, are often speak the loudest. Mm-hmm. People aren't coming online and being like, guess how many, uh, how much long I took birth control for and how quickly I got pregnant. Totally. Those aren't the stories that No, we that's hear true. About. That's true. So we hear about the an- anecdotes, and they speak powerfully. But the truth is, well, a, a lot of these these beliefs stem from high dose hormonal birth control, which mm-hmm. is what first came on the market. And there definitely was an association with increased rates of infertility. Mm-hmm. But um, the the most recent, most comprehensive evidence does show that low dose hormonal birth control does not reduce fertility anymore compared to other forms of contraception or to those who are not taking it. So it's when about you're saying 15- other form of contraception, do you mean like IUDs. condoms? IUDs okay, and condoms and such. Yeah. There was a recent um, meta-analysis that showed that there was about an 85% uh, chance of successful pregnancy following uh, discontinuation of both forms, of mm-hmm. both of those types of forms of contraceptives. And that's about the same as we see in the general population. We see about a 15% risk of infertility just generally. 
among women. Okay. I'm just very skeptical that anything that stops our like biology from ovulating couldn't have effects. I get it. Well, and there is one thing to say. It does take about three months for hormonal birth control to clear your system. Mm -hmm. So there is certainly a delayed time to conception in those Mm -hmm. first three months after you discontinue it. And that's the average time. Yeah. So maybe some women, it might take them longer. I know after yeah. I went off of birth control, it took me about a year to get pregnant. Mm-hmm. My second pregnancy, I got pregnant the first month. Mm-hmm. So That's great. it didn't cause, at least for me, again, yeah, we're yeah. talking about an anecdote. Yeah, yeah, I know. But, because they're very, like, they're research. Now, like, you know, we just like to be say. careful with, like, no, anyone no, thinking I, about it. It worked for me. No, but that's, um, like, very responsible. That's how it should be. Yeah. I think just so much of the human heart drives towards anecdotes. It's easy for us. Totally. It's, it's easier for us to understand than, totally. than research because, you know, the average layman doesn't know how to read yeah. mm-hmm. read research, you know, so you kind of have to just take someone's word for it. And there's a lot of different things going Sure. Back and forth. I mean, there are endocrine disruptors mm-hmm. that are unfortunately in our environment that mm-hmm. may be affecting fertility. Things like phthalates, things like polycyclic uh, aromatic hydrocarbons. I and mean, mm-hmm. these are all things that have been known to be endocrine disruptors. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, these environmental toxins also are stored in adipose tissue. So I mean, there's there's lots of factors and there's lots of things that I think may be affecting things. Mm -hmm. It's just hard to sort of say at like at this point in time, this specifically and this amount is going to decrease by, you know, fertility by this much. Yeah. No, it makes a lot of sense. And everyone should do what makes sense for them. But for me and myself, it always just didn't feel quite right. And then anyone that I know who has taken it has had side effects. And then when I hear experts talking about it, it's like, no, 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 there's nothing wrong with it. So I get it's a healthy skepticism, you know, and it, and it, it speaks a lot to other movements in the health space about this idea of what's natural seems to be right. And in some cases, what's more natural is, is healthy for us. Yeah. And in some cases, at least with the current available evidence that we have, um, things that may sound a little obscure or they're not mm-hmm. natural aren't necessarily. Okay, like what's us. a so, good example for that then? Well, if we want to talk about like the dose makes the poison argument, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. we could talk about things like water mm-hmm. where, you know, it's healthy at a normal amount. It's a natural substance, but in, it, taking in an excessive amount could have harmful effects. So totally. there's lots of there's or, lots of things like that. Yeah, There's or of- vitamin D. I mean, we don't live natural lives. Most of us are not mm-hmm. here in the beautiful tropics where I live in St. Louis above the 37th parallel inside a lot of the time because it's snowing all the time yeah. <laughs> in the winter. I mean, I just don't have access to to vitamin D production in, in my skin yeah. from the sun. So, you know, for me to be able to get enough vitamin D, I would need to supplement or use fortified foods where – that is not sort of the the natural way or the way that we may be all used to get vitamin D production, but it's also the safest and most effective way yeah. for me and my family to get vitamin D. So, yeah, you know, I think, there's, I think there's definitely different arguments we could say, here's the natural version, but here's also in this sort of practical world where – our lives are different. You know, I'm not outside all the time with my baby on the back because this is just the way that my life is. I I work inside. I work at a desk and, you know, things I have to factor in, even though they might not be the most quote unquote natural path. Yeah. And of course there's always pros and cons. So I think one of the biggest things that people will bring up when talking about strict plant-based diets is the fact that if you need a supplement, it's not natural, specifically for B12, Mm -hmm. but you have to think about the pros and cons. So the pro is you're taking B12 and then you're not eating an excessive amount of animal products. Mm -hmm. Yes, maybe you could get B12 from those products, but you're also getting other things Mm -hmm. that in excess are associated with health problems. So there's always that that weighing yeah, of I, issues. I feel like there's a healthy balance of yes. like going towards what's natural, but then also taking advantage of what we now know and research and yeah. be able to utilize these products that we can, that can make our totally. lives better and easier. One last thing before yeah. we move on to yeah, that yeah, is the idea of if it's natural, it's the best way to be. It's kind of a moot point. We don't live really in a natural environment. Again, no. you live pretty close to yeah. nature here. <laughs> but still. But most of us don't. Yeah. We have so many issues that our ancestors didn't. We have environmental contaminants yeah. that are in our water, that are in our soil. We have depleted soil. We have all these issues that uh, prehistoric people didn't face. We have a mm-hmm. climate crisis. We have mm-hmm. to think about all these issues that go beyond just is that the way people used to eat? Yeah. We are not those people anymore. Our world is not that world. Yeah. And yeah. Not something that Dr. Gemma Newman mentioned mm-hmm. in the episode I did with her was that people are always trying to go back to the way that we used to eat and used to live. But 
She's like, at which part of the world though, people right. ate so differently exactly. in different parts of the world and they didn't actually live longer or healthier lives yes. anyways. And so we why were, are we trying to get back to that? Such an important argument. And I, I think <clears throat> we, we sort of romanticize this idea that like, oh, our ancestors exactly were living these like long, beautiful, yeah. healthy lives. Yeah. Like, yeah, like let's take a course in public health because <laughs> nutrient deficiencies were rampant mm -hmm. until we had a lot of these, you know, fortification and supplementation and enrichment programs and, you know, just sort of the, the advances we've been able to make in not only human health, but especially when it comes to, you know, infant and child mortality yeah. has been dramatic over the past 50 years. Yeah. And so I think that, again, it's not to say that like so-and-so in, you know, the early man was necessarily healthier or better than we are now just because yeah. it was a more natural way of being. They yeah. were doing what they needed to do to just survive. Survive, yeah. <laughs> That's an interesting point to bring up because some people would look at that and say, yeah, well, we traded, maybe we helped certain things like survival, but we aren't actually thriving in the way that we used to. Like maybe there's all these extra diseases that we have now that we didn't mm -hmm. used to have. What do you think about that? I think this is something you talked about with Gemma Newman, yeah. but that's just not true. I mean, there's plenty of evidence that early societies, like the Inuits perhaps, had cardiovascular disease mm. and had some blockage in their arteries. Yeah. So we don't have evidence to show yeah. that early man didn't suffer for something. Yes, there are lots of lifestyle yeah. diseases that are newer, but they're multifactorial mm -hmm. and they're not necessarily based on nutrition alone. Mm -hmm. And this all ties into fertility because fertility is part of yes. our help. Yes. So what about other things that could potentially cause fertility issues? I think what you said makes a lot of sense about the way that we're tracking it and women are having babies later or wanting to get pregnant later in life yeah. as opposed to earlier in life. But what about other things like chemicals in our food? Is, is there any research on that to say that that affects fertility? Yeah. I mean, I, I think if any woman is struggling with fertility issues, the, the first thing I would do is talk about, okay, let's sort of work on the things that we know we have control over, right? Mm -hmm. So focusing on diet first, perhaps, you know, where, where are you currently at? Where do we sort of optimally need to be? Where can we help to work on those gaps? Other lifestyle factors, you know, exercise. We talk a lot about nutrition, but having a healthy body weight is really helpful when it mm -hmm. comes to fertility odds, movement, reducing stress, adequate sleep. I mean, these are sort of all things that are sort of in our, our locus of control. And then also the reality too, that there are hormo hormonal things that could be outside of a woman's control too. And I think sometimes too, we are so focused on I think I think women especially feel when they have a tr hard time getting pregnant that they should feel like oh th there's all of this like weight on me mm -hmm. and all of this like societal blame or personal blame it feels like a failing and I think that's because you know for a lot of women not every woman but there's sort of always been this idea of becoming a mother mm -hmm. and so when there's a struggle in getting to that place you know it can feel really hard and then to be told you know well it's because you're doing this you're doing that i think it really needs to be as supportive as possible and also not forgetting the guy yeah because you know two to tango. it takes two to tango <laughs> yeah. and and our, often it always gets put on yes, the woman well yes. and research shows 25 percent of infertility cases are due to male factors mm. and wow so, and yeah that's yet, a lot a the lot. entire onus always or almost always falls on women. We all want beautiful, comfortable clothing that's also flattering to your body. Indigo Luna is yoga chic. These are the types of clothes that you can rock day to day, whether you're at home doing dishes, going to your favorite yoga class or shopping at the grocery store. Well, at least the grocery store part works for Maui standards. I'm not sure if anywhere else it really works because here, if you see someone wearing heels and a pencil skirt in the grocery store in Hawaii, it's clear that they don't live here. Anyways, Indigo Luna has ethically made yoga wear, swimwear, intimates, and loungewear. They are slow fashion and sustainably sourced with beautiful, simple shapes, earthy colors, and plant dyes from recycled or organic materials. Everything is cut, sewn, and dyed by a loving human hand, and they ensure that every person involved in production works in comfortable, safe conditions. I love supporting companies with conscious practices. It feels good to vote with my dollars in this way, and it really is a win-win situation here because these clothes feel so comfortable on my body. They hug and hold my curves just right. So enter the code Ellen10 for 10% off your order or click the link in my show notes. Yeah. And we've been talking a lot about sort of the, the optimal foods, but we haven't really touched on the foods that we also know are associated with 
impaired fertility. Okay, let's get so, into that. Yeah, especially um, so so diets rich in um, refined carbohydrates, mm-hmm. added sugars, and you know again we look at sort of the the average American diet. I think it's like sixty percent of of calories typically comes from ultra processed foods. I mean, can you give some examples of specific foods that are refined carbohydrates and sugar? I'm guessing I'm guessing you mean processed sure, sugar, right? Yeah. Not whole fruit. Oh, yes. Sugar from no, fruit. No, yes. So like, yeah. So what, refined what exactly carbohydrates, is, yeah. basically when you take a grain, for example, mm-hmm. and you remove the outer bran layer, that's mm-hmm. refining it. The mm-hmm. outer bran layer is where the fiber is. So we're talking about things that have been stripped of fiber. They've been stripped of their minerals. So white flour, white pasta, white rice, a lot of the packaged foods that mm-hmm. you find. Like cereals. White bread. Yeah. Um, so yeah, cereals, if they're not oat-based mm-hmm. or corn-based. Corn mm-hmm. is actually a whole grain. Surprise, mm-hmm. surprise. Yeah. Um, so we're Fast talking food. about... Yeah, yeah. Yes, fast, fast food, food, which is the majority of the of the American diet, and then like of sugar, course sugar, sugar yeah. Yeah. yeah, and sugar is we're talking mainly about refined sugar, condensed sugar, so um, not the sugar that's found in fruit, which comes complexed with all of those things we talked about that are beneficial in the grains, the fiber, mm-hmm. um, the vitamins. Those things are all removed when you make sugar mm. from a fruit, yeah, or make a fruit juice or something like that. Yeah, so these are the things that have been associated with. Poor health across the board, but also with specifically infertility. I didn't know that. Whole grains, fiber-rich carbohydrates, mm-hmm. are actually associated with increased chance of fertility mm-hmm. and improved pregnancy outcomes as well. Yeah, and you know, I think this is really important because when we sort of look at at what people are eating, unfortunately, it is a lot of these foods. So just sort of cleaning up or replacing, I should say, these ultra-processed foods with more of the the fruits, the vegetables, whole grains. I mean, even if we're not taking it all the way sort of to a plant-exclusive model, it has huge ramifications when it comes to overall fertility, especially taking out other things that we know may be harmful in fertility, especially in men. High intakes of red meat have been associated with risk of fertility in men, um, also mm. processed meats, and then trans fats in both men and women. Like, and saturated fat as oh, well saturated has fat. been associated with a reduced risk of fertility. Of in- reduced risk of fertility, increased risk of infertility. Oh, increased risk. Yes. But like Alex said, because of the nutrients that we know are high in diets that are based largely upon meat and processed meats, um, though the research doesn't show specifically for women, it's likely that that would be harmful for fertility too, since it is shown in the research on men. Hmm. If we, instead of focus on what we're trying to limit and focus on what we want to increase in the diet, yeah. there's... Uh, ample research showing Mm -hmm. the benefits of diets high in monounsaturated fat and polyunsaturated fat, specifically DHA, Mm -hmm. um, both for fertility, but also during pregnancy, specifically for infant brain development. So really ramping up those nutrients, which then in turn kind of decreases the saturated fat in the diet. Okay. And again, when you're focusing on all of these foods, like the whole grains, fruits and vegetables, you naturally will be limiting your saturated fat. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, if, if I was a, a woman or a man listening to this, I think, you know, when I'm advising clients, the first thing I would say is, Okay, let's look at sort of where we currently are and and where are sort of maybe some small changes we can start with and then sort of build from there because mm-hmm. there are so many things and I think sometimes especially when we're trying to hit this this goal of becoming pregnant it can feel really overwhelming and then stressful which can maybe you know in impair fertility and so I think it's like taking really manageable steps uh, for overall health and you know like we keep sort of you know harping on too Yes, we're talking specifically about fertility, but so many of these things are also the same when it comes to pregnancy, mm-hmm. when it comes to, you know, overall optimal diet to reduce risk of chronic disease. It's not like, I mean, things definitely change a little during certain life stages, but for the most part, we're talking about the very same dietary pattern for overall mm-hmm. health. When I'm counseling a client, I I like to try to get them away from focusing on quantitative measures of health and yeah. really focus on qualitative mm-hmm. and specifically what we want to add to the diet. So yep. instead of the focus being like, I need to limit saturated fat down to this number, it's like, well, how can I add more of these beneficial fats that I know are going to be helpful for improving my fertility chances or improving my pregnancy? Like, how can I get more avocados in my diet? Where can I add more nuts and seeds? Mm -hmm. And so kind of from this uh, perspective of abundance versus a perspective of what needs to be limited. Yeah. And that's helpful not just uh, physically, yeah. but also mentally, which yeah. is such emotionally. a huge, so huge. Emotionally, such a huge aspect yeah. of any health, but definitely when you're in a sensitive state, I think. Totally. I love with- how supportive you are being and how 
just encouraging that you guys are about this topic because like you said it can be a sensitive time especially if everyone around them is easily getting pregnant left yeah. and right mm -hmm. and how discouraging that must be for those who are going through that and just trying to figure it out so that yeah. is super important and then the other thing you brought up about polyunsaturated fats can we talk a little bit about that because mm -hmm. Sometimes it's kind of all lumped together. Like, are we talking whole food polyunsaturated fat? Or are you talking canola oil? You know yeah. what I'm saying? Like all that, that aspect. The research is mainly specifically on the long chain omega-3 fatty acids, DHA. Mm -hmm. So it's really mono, for, specifically if we're talking about fertility um, and pregnancy. DHA is primarily found in, in seafood. This is because fish consume microalgae and it accumulates in their tissues. So the main dietary source for most people would be fish, but people following plant-predominant plant-based diets or those who simply don't like to eat fish can easily obtain DHA through an algae-based supplement. The other thing is our body does make DHA from the plant-based omega-3 fatty acid ALA, alpha-linolenic acid, which is found in things like chia seeds and flax and walnuts. The conversion rate is low though and perhaps too low to support optimal amounts, specifically during pregnancy and lactation, which is why um, ACOG as well as the AAP recommend that if you don't consume fish during these periods of time that you should supplement mm -hmm. uh, with 200 to 300 milligrams a day. Interesting. And I it makes sense like everything's about covering your bases mm -hmm. for everybody for me myself and all five of my births and pregnancy i never took an algae supplement i always just ate mm -hmm. plenty of chia seeds flax seeds yeah. all that yeah. walnuts mm -hmm. eating lots of that and yes. for me i've just always been like very good at eating super whole foods based like very consistent mm -hmm. in my life and the way that i live and so i always just trusted myself that yeah. i i feel yeah. i felt good i didn't feel like i needed it but again i'm not the dietitians here like giving <laughs> out mass advice so it makes sense to have both options i think like individuality well and you say. know remembering too that these these recommendations from from acog are really towards again sort of the the average american and when we look at survey data of what is being consumed, it's not copious amounts of chia <laughs> seeds or hemp seeds or yeah. walnuts, you know, and and I think these these guidelines are really to sort of, you know, ensure optimal prenatal health, um, but also optimal infant health because so much of what happens uh, in so much of the baby is sort of determined by mom's nutrition uh, in utero. So is the main reason then not to just recommend, oh, make sure to eat a quarter cup of hemp seeds every day because the conversions, you know, you just don't know exactly yeah. where the conversion lies. So just to be safe, take a supplement. Because for me, we're just, we go through so much hemp seeds in our yeah. family. And we're like, this yeah. is good. It also might make more sense economically yeah. for someone to, to buy a supplement versus, mm, depending so? on how expensive mm. your hemp guess, seeds yeah, are. <laughs> and it depends a quarter on the cup supplement. of hemp seeds every day is a lot of hemp seeds. We, we just add a lot in our smoothies yeah. and, and no, everything. No, I have it in breakfast yeah. in our oatmeal yeah. every morning and yeah. our pancakes. So yeah. yeah, some of this we don't know, you know, is there mm. inter-individual? inter-individuality mm -hmm. with conversion rates that hasn't yeah. been explored that much either maybe people yeah. who are following predominantly or pl fully plant-based diets have higher conversion rates mm -hmm. yes this yeah. is where um you know we've talked about this before not here but off camera yeah. um the the macro aspects of diets that are universal which is like these dietary patterns that are generally associated with health for everyone and then the micro aspects of, of health which may have a little bit of variability from person yeah. to person again this the acog recommendation is to meet the needs of the general public of people who are not necessarily consuming the most nutrient dense diets just to make sure that they are getting dha one way or another yeah which makes sense it yeah. should be and and because like the conversion is, it could be so variable and because we don't have exact amounts we can't say a quarter cup of let's say chia seeds it hasn't be been adequate. tested yeah. exactly yeah, yeah yeah so it's like we know the average conversion rate of ala to dha yeah we know what that is yeah but we don't know what it is for you and we yeah. don't know what it would be if you're eating a ton so, yeah. yeah totally no and that's why what you guys do is so important because yeah. there aren't a lot of people out there giving the research evidence-based information mm -hmm. for people to know to take it and know what to do with it yeah i think that's you start with the guidelines yeah. And then you figure out how that fits for your family. Yeah, for sure. Okay, so I want to go back to something you mentioned about weight and being an optimal weight. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Does it that mean if you're like under a certain weight or over a certain weight, 
what does that mean for fertility? Yeah, yeah. So uh, there's there's an association with both being underweight and with having uh, overweight or obesity when it comes to both fertility and pregnancy. When you are underweight, you may have a harder time becoming pregnant. We need to have adequate uh, adipose tissue, adequate, adequate body fat uh, to be able to support growing a fetus. And really when it comes to pregnancy, that is the concern with women who are underweight is having a small for gestational age infant. Um, with women who are overweight, but really with women who have obesity, fertility also plays a role. It's, it's why a lot of times uh, when there is a struggle to become pregnant, if a woman does have, uh, or does present with obesity, a lot of times the recommendation is to try weight loss to help with fertility. And then when it comes to pregnancy specifically, um, also having excess weight gain during pregnancy is associated with increased risk of gestational diabetes, preeclampsia, having a large for gestational infant. So there definitely is sort of this optimal weight range that we would like to see uh, for both fertility and pregnancy. But that's also not to say that you cannot become pregnant or have a healthy pregnancy sort of in, in either end. It's it's just sort of where the the research currently is and you know weight weight is one factor when it comes to overall health because this can be a really sensitive subject yeah uh, for for most women absolutely yeah so it, it can be a very sensitive topic but it is helpful really helpful for people to know I think a lot of people don't even know that yeah that well oh. yeah I, I just I like you said kind of to synthesize it like the the bottom line is losing weight can be helpful for improving fertility and you can have fertility and a healthy pregnancy if you are in a larger body. It doesn't necessarily mean that your infertility is, is in, um, in question. And this is really because what Alex said, the excess adipose tissue um, can lead to some sort of metabolic derangements, things like insulin resistance. And these things are, are associated with increased infertility mm -hmm. and those are improved by weight loss. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the beauties of eating a whole foods plant-based diet mm -hmm. is that you really do get to eat until you're totally satisfied. You listen to you. it. Actually, is very amazing how the body works because when you're eating a diet rich in water and fiber and all those nutrients, it fills you up and you naturally know what to stop. But if you're eating a diet rich in ultra processed foods mm -hmm. or super high calorie animal based products as the majority of your diet, you end up having to calorie restrict. And by doing that, that's where you end up going at, mm -hmm. back and forth about which which way is your your weight. But when you're eating so consistently whole foods plant-based and the majority of your foods are food is from whole foods maintaining your optimal weight is one of i think one of the best things or one of the easiest factors of eating whole foods plant-based definitely it goes back to that fiber it helps mm -hmm. you stay fuller longer you can better sense your satiety cues mm -hmm. so yeah well, then, you know, if, especially if we're talking about uh, fertility and, and pregnancy too if we are counseling on on weight loss it would also want to be done within sort of the concept of a nutrient dense diet. Yeah, um, not you know, anything to lose weight. Yeah, sure. yeah, but, but meaning too, like there are lots of ways to lose weight. Mm -hmm. They they just also don't coincide with being optimal for fertility, and so it's and optimally really healthy. Mm -hmm. Yes, sort of this like you know double edged approach, and it wanting to ensure both. And you know, the last thing I'll just say is that. There definitely is some controversy in the literature when it comes to women who um, women with obesity and weight gain, weight loss during pregnancy. So there are a lot of individual factors that you'd want to consider, and we would really recommend working closely with your doctor, with your midwife, to figure out sort of what is going to be optimal for you. Yeah, and to be clear, like you said, weight is just one factor because you right. can be at a healthy quote unquote weight, but not be healthy on the inside. Absolutely. And you know, the opposite can be true too, where you're eating really well, but you might not be in this quote unquote, yeah, you know, sure. optimal weight. And so there's variations here. But what's amazing about like eating whole foods is that it becomes kind of a little bit seamless. Yeah. Whereas I, just the life that I knew before eating plant-based was a lot of just like, well, after I had gone through puberty, all of a sudden I couldn't, couldn't just eat Doritos and Snicker bars that break in high school every day. I was yeah. like, oh shoot, I'm actually like starting <laughs> to gain weight here. And so then I had to take into this measurement because I didn't know how to eat well. No mm -hmm. one taught me how to mm -hmm. eat well. You know, my parents were doing the best that they knew at of the course. time. We had a lot of fruits and vegetables in the house, but we also had a lot of, you know, a lot of junk too. Yeah. So that's when people start not knowing what to do because they just want to, you know, they want to feel good in their body, yeah. not just weight wise, but feeling good. Totally. And so then, 
weight or restriction starts coming in with food and that's just not sustainable. So like you said, when you, oh, you can do all these different types of diets to lose weight, but is that going to be sustainable and healthy for you? That's the key difference. Yeah. Yeah. Well, a blanket recommendation Mm -hmm. to lose weight can result in you perhaps increasing your chance of fertility thanks to the weight loss, but decreasing your chance of fertility due to the nutrients that you're consuming. Mm. So if you're not doing it with these quality foods, these foods that we know are uh, associated with improved fertility outcomes, then it kind of might even negate the weight loss or set you up for uh, other long-term health complications. That's awesome. That's so well said. Yeah. This is what I was trying to say. I was just taking a <laughs> no, really you said long it too. Yeah, I get it. I mean, <laughs> And I really relate to that too because back in high school, you know, when mm-hmm. all of the societal pressure really starts to bear down regarding yeah. aesthetics and weight and you're like calorie counting, yeah. all that matters is that you keep the calories down. It doesn't yeah. matter what you're eating. Mm-hmm. That's not a recipe for long-term health. Yeah, exactly. And and then there's other things that come into play too after puberty like maybe acne yeah. and all mm-hmm. these different things. You're like, what is going on? Maybe I just try to not eat here. And mm-hmm. some, some yeah. women are still trying to figure it out. So many women like get into their adulthood and still going, what do I do to feel well totally. and so that's why what you guys do and you know sharing about eating whole foods <laughs> is so amazing and so important well and this and is a, <laughs> a whole you know other thing but we just we don't we don't teach these things you mm-hmm. know like i mean there is such a lack of um not even just nutrition but culinary education uh when it comes to kids when it comes to you know really understanding and navigating this world and so i think that there, there are so many factors of why, unfortunately, a lot of us get to adulthood and it's like, I don't I don't know what to do. Before I, I got into pediatrics, I worked for a long time in uh, university athletics and I had so many students who would be, you know, 18, 19 on their own for the first time and would be like, I, I, I don't know how to nourish myself. I don't know how to cook. I don't even know how to prepare things. Like, what do you mean you want me to make pasta? Like, I, I, I boil the water. Like I know how to make easy Mac. And, you know, unfortunately I think there is just such a, a societal lack of perhaps even how it used to be of really like passing down some of these culinary skills, some of these nutrition know-hows throughout the generations. Yeah. And that does take into account like, okay, maybe there's, there are certain things that we did in the past that we need to get back to our roots a little bit more, growing our own food, Mm -hmm. things like that, getting more connected to our food. Well, and it's time. I mean, you know, we, we, we've also evolved into for a lot of American families, and I say American just because I know the data well for that, Mm -hmm. uh, dual income households, Mm -hmm. you know, and so where time is of, you know, sort of the essence. And uh, this is why there is such a big rise too in in inconvenience, you know, foods, but also, you know, other technologies. And, you know, I think about myself too, like my husband works, I work. It does take effort and it does take time to to prepare certain things and to be in the kitchen with my kids and to cook together. And that is a huge value for me. And so I, I make the time and the effort to do it. But I also understand that there are so many factors in so many lives where that feels like just one more thing to have to get done. Yeah. And so I'm not trying to place blame when I say that there is sort of this lack of of overall sort of culinary nutrition education, but it's yeah, it's it's sort of this dichotomy of a lot of us are raised on more ultra processed convenience foods, why that is, and then also that sort of loss that happens mm-hmm. with understanding how to now be on your own and and cook and provide. And just the time it takes, yeah. like you said, with how busy life is. I definitely can attest to that. When I had one, <laughs> parents would kind of be like, oh, it's so hard to, you know, make foods from scratch. And I had to do it. And I'd be, I'd be like, oh, it's so easy. Yeah. And then I had two and then three and then four and then five. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, we are going through so much hummus. And we, we make so much hummus, yeah. and, you know, just so much hummus, like four cans of beans that we drain and rinse and make hummus because we go through so much that wow. I want it to be sure. a really nutritious yeah. hummus. I don't want to just buy a store-bought one that has ingredients that I don't think are mm-hmm. optimal for our family. So we make it from scratch, but we're doing this like tw- like twice a week. So much hummus because there's so much of us. Yeah, yeah. that's yeah. just an example. We're yeah. not just eating hummus. That's a lot of time <laughs> to make. It's time. Eat hummus. Yes. Yeah. I'm like yes. we're out of hummus again. <laughs> so yeah. that as an yeah. example. Yeah. Okay. So moving on, let's talk a little bit about this kind of rise, this increase in talk on um, organ meats mm. and that for pregnancy and fertility. There's a mini documentary. It features the psychiatrist Paul Saladino, and Love it, that you mentioned he's a psychiatrist. Yeah, that's a really way. important thing. It's, it's important to I mention. It's, yeah, I mean, 
a lot a lot of people just want to say, oh, yeah, Dr. Paul Saladino, but, like, he is a psychiatrist. That's really important to preface. Mm -hmm. Like, not saying that's not important. It is, but I don't know. Anyways, at this right, particular topic. Your expertise topic, is not nutrition. Yeah. Let's it's, just start Yeah, with it's that. really <laughs> important. Um, so this mini documentary is coming out talking about organ meats and the importance of, you know, a really rich animal food-based diet for pregnancy and fertility. It even went into this specific example, which just kills me, you guys. <laughs> it showed this placenta saying that this this one placenta is like not healthy looking. It's dull. It doesn't have all the vibrant veins and colors. And that was from a vegan diet and then the, or, or like a non-animal based diet. I don't know if they specifically said vegan or vegetarian. I can't remember. But the other the other one was this vibrant, full, healthy placenta. And, and the midwife or whoever was narrating was like, the, the difference was so stark from the animal based. And I just like that anecdote just really kills me. Because if you want to talk anecdotes, like all <laughs> five of my births, like I literally have it documented on video footage. Like if we're just going to play devil's advocate with, yeah. the, with the anecdotes here were the most vibrant, colorful placentas yes. that even after my first one, I think my midwife was, my first midwife back when I was in California said, well, whatever you did was working for you. Because back when I, I've been, you know, vegan for 16 years now. So it definitely wasn't quite, it wasn't on the uprise mm -hmm. back when I had started. And so my midwife was supportive, but she's like, oh, I don't know. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, no, I got this. I'm so healthy. Like, don't worry about me. And then when my baby was born, she's like, whoa, that is the healthiest placenta I've ever seen. She literally said yeah. that. The proof is in the placenta. Yeah, yeah. But, but, yeah, okay, the proof is in the placenta. But then what, which title. anecdote yeah. are you going to take? You know what I'm saying? Because like wow. that anecdote, what kind of diet was that vegan? There's so many different ways to eat. Totally. I think we need a call for placental photos and we can just like start swapping them around. I've got mine. It's yeah. also bright and red and beautiful. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, just this whole thing is so silly. Mm -hmm. We've got so many thoughts. Yeah, like, where, where to, to begin? Okay, yes, I think go. the first thing, uh, let's start with why consuming organ meats is silly to begin mm -hmm. with. One, we don't have a lot of data showing that women were consuming tons of organ meat. Yes, we have um, evidence that people have consumed meat since uh, throughout the course of history and prehistoric times and likely did consume um, some organ meats, but this idea that pregnant women or women for fertility were consuming diets based largely on these things is just, there's no evidence for that. Hmm. The second thing is the potential harms of consuming organ meats. Okay. Organ meats are concentrated sources of some of these nutrients and some of them that have upper tolerable levels that we want to stay below. So one of those is preformed vitamin A, which an increased intake of um, or an excessive intake in pregnancy has been linked to birth defects. So that's one of the nutrients that uh, all of the major health organizations are like, don't get too much preformed vitamin A during pregnancy. Um, a preformed lot of is retinol. Retinol, Just yes, to be correct. Mm. So that's retinol. That's the kind that's found in animal foods. And then the other source of vitamin A is carotenoids, which is found in plant foods, which there is not an um, upper tolerable level for because our body excretes any excess. We have a very like finely tuned system where we can meet all of our vitamin A needs with plant foods. And if we consume a lot of it, no, no harm, no foul, we get rid of it. So why do people think then that like the vitamin A, the real quote unquote real vitamin A is what they call it from animal foods? Why do they think that that's better than beta -carotene? I mean, it's, it's, it's more bioavailable as far as absorption, right? Okay. So, you know, I think, I think a lot of the arguments with organ meats, at least what I've seen, and again, just to be clear too, there is no research showing that consuming organ meats during pregnancy or infertility is beneficial or has, you know, increased to, to help uh, with women becoming pregnant or having a better uh, pregnancy outcome. There's nothing on that? There is. There's nothing, no. And that actually the only research regarding organ meats and pregnancy is suggesting that women avoid them mm -hmm. for this reason. Wow. Because of the vitamin A, beef liver, three ounces, contains more than two times the upper tolerable level of vitamin A for pregnancy. Wow. It's very risky. Wow. Additionally, so the liver is our detoxification system. Mm -hmm. This is where we take environmental contaminants, heavy, heavy metals, metals. <laughs> and we get and we process them and um, try to make them less harmful to our body. Mm -hmm. So all of these things can be found in the liver, in an animal's liver. This is not necessarily – it's a great source, great source of certain nutrients. Mm -hmm. But it's not the only source and it's definitely not the safest source. Mm. And it's a I think the counter, dangerous argument, the counter argument I've heard about the liver thing is that because it is a recycling, it's excreting it, so it's not actually it's not in the liver. It's not storing it. Yeah, yes. it's, storing it. it's not a storage but, organ. Yes. Yeah. 
It is. It's going through there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, at any given time. Yeah. It totally. may be found in there. Yeah. I mean, it, the liver is an excellent source of iron. So that tends to be the the argument, the big push, you know, especially knowing that, you know, almost 30% of women, according to survey data, are iron deficient in their last trimester of pregnancy. There seems to be this sort of movement around organ meats specifically during pregnancy and in early infancy too because of the iron argument. But because it is such a, a wonderfully concentrated source of iron, it is also a wonderfully concentrated source of all of these other things that we really would want to be a lot more cautious of, especially in periods of growth, pregnancy, early childhood. So, um, you know, I, I definitely hear the argument around liver or organ meats as sort of an iron rich source. We can't deny that. But I also think we have to really take into account of what are the other considerations for that. And, you know, one, again, two, there's no precedence for, for why this would be an optimal food during fertility and pregnancy. And also there is real concern around excessive retinol intake. And vitamin A is so concentrated not only in liver, but also things like cod liver oil. And, and both of those are recommended to really not be consumed during pregnancy. You know, and it's getting back to the foods that we know support fertility. Mm -hmm. If we can find these nutrients and foods that are actually are associated with beneficial fertility outcomes, why would we turn to something that has no data showing that mm -hmm. it's beneficial and potentially all of these harmful side effects? Yeah. Why wouldn't we go get our vitamin A from mangoes and sweet potatoes yeah. and things that actually take a very small amount to meet your vitamin A needs? Why wouldn't we get iron from things like whole grains and legumes and nuts and seeds, which are also going to be high in unsaturated fatty acids, which are also going to be high in fiber. Um, it's just kind of nonsensical. Can I say too, I've been looking a little at like some of these uh, various individuals who who promote sort of this idea. And and yeah, I mean, it feels, it, it really calls to that sort of like, you know, appeal to nature, mm -hmm. you know, the sort of like, I think, innateness that sometimes we want to have to be like, oh, this must be how our ancestors ate. I mean, I know, especially for when I was pregnant, I, I did feel so close to nature because I was literally growing life. Yeah. And I think so many women resonate with this idea of like, I just want to sort of shut everything out. I want to like dig into the earth and get yeah. back to like sort of like this this vibe. And I think that it is a really sexy appeal to then feel like, oh yeah, I'm going to get, you know, sort of nature's multivitamin, which I've heard liver be called and, and eat it. And, you know, sort of having this like healing ceremonial, like I'm eating this, this organ of this animal. I feel like those are, are sort of these calls and it, I, I understand this appeal. I get it. But when we look at the evidence, when we look at the science, when we look at sort of the, not only the efficacy, but also potential harms, I, I definitely don't feel comfortable as a dietitian, especially one who specializes in fertility, pregnancy, early childhood, to feel like this is a safe option. I mean, and just to keep compounding on all of the issues, we are, we're not even talking about the environmental yes, implications yes. of everyone thinking say. that they need to eat an excessive amount of meat and organs. Well, specifically, we wouldn't be able to liver. produce enough or liver. Yeah, if there's, there's one, per one cow. specific organ, is oh my the God. amount of cow they'd have to start killing you, cows just for the liver oh because there wouldn't be enough demand for the there'd be more demand for the actual liver than the yes, rest of everything exactly. else. Exactly, and we would have to have so, so have to many more cows. So Where would we many, live? Yeah, I know there would be. It's so just many not cows. logical. Yeah. It's kind of similar to the fish recommendation of women consuming, or actually, really, I think they recommend it for all health, two servings of fish per week. If people actually did that, um, the oceans would be completely fished mm. out. Mm. So we, we, we can't think in such a micro way mm -hmm. about these things. And then you see with these uh, people promoting this, are people actually eating the liver? No. They're turning them into supplements, mm -hmm. and people are selling them. And so back to your documentary... The documentary is made by a supplement company. Mm, their main it? drive yeah, it's like is to sell soil. their liver supplements. Wow. That's interesting. I mean, there's always going to so be makes like you just anecdotally, right? Like, or devil's advocate again. Like, every documentary, they are going to have some kind of motive, but Agenda, you're right. It sure. isn't necessarily to like sell something after that. But I don't know. Selling something isn't necessarily a negative 
thing because no. yeah. you ha- everyone has to make money on the things they're passionate about. Sure. That's part of how you can yeah. continue to spread the word on something you're passionate about. But it does come into play a little bit of bias because it gives you a moment of pause yeah. to just consider what's your agenda with this with this yeah. so-called documentary. Yeah, even if this was optimal, right? Let's just say that this is optimal. It's not optimal when we consider where we are currently in sort of the the history of human health, the responsibility that we have, especially when we're talking about, you know, bringing in more, more people, you know, raising the next generation to ignore the ecological impact, to not consider both the environment and the impact that these food choices have is just... I mean, it's it's elitist. It's just irresponsible. yeah, irresponsible. <laughs> I mean, it's just it just I think really also falls on deaf ears, you know, of sort of like where we need to go and the conversations we need to be having, and some of these ancestral sort of type of conversations. One, they're not truly aligned with what we know to be sort of the quote unquote paleo diet, and also it's just not even if again if it was optimal it's just not optimal we consider both planetary and human health mm-hmm. but that's even if it was optimal even right? if it was even optimal. if it was yeah. it's not <laughs> but it's not what about high the high raw dairy type of recommendation in that realm yeah. as well like gallons so, of it, like like yeah, yeah. pints of it every yeah. day. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, in regards to dairy intake at all and its impact on fertility, it looks to be possibly neutral. There's a lot of variability in the research about the kinds of dairy, whether low fat or high fat, and how it impacts fertility. Um, at this point, the current recommendation is dairy intake is likely has a neutral effect on fertility. What concerns me about what the ancestral communities are are supporting in regards to dairy is this idea that pregnant women should be consuming raw milk, Mm -hmm. which has a really high food safety risk of bacterial contamination. Mm -hmm. So it's just, it's not a safe recommendation. Um, Is that because, though, is there, is there all an understanding that maybe the raw milk would be better than pasteurized? And if you, if they like go and trust the source and they know that they're doing things really well. They're not doing it at a massive amount. Like to me, that does make sense. Well, I'd st- I mean, I'd start with like we don't have a ton of data saying that milk intake period is all mm-hmm. that beneficial. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I don't uh, know if you even need to. No, like, yeah. Aside from that, right, just, right. just like the but safety is, aspect is of raw, raw milk. Versus- well, yeah, I guess if you were there and they milk the cow and you drink it immediately after, mm-hmm. um, you can have a high likelihood that you're not going to have a bacterial contamination. It's the time after mm-hmm. um, that it's sitting there for unpasteurized products yeah. that bacteria can quickly multiply into the yeah. point where you can't smell it, you can't taste it, you can't see it. Yeah. Um, it's a risk. And, it's, and, and, and so, why? Yeah. And why? And then so then it goes back to why. Why would you take that risk? Yeah. And it's I, that's how we feel a lot about a lot of foods that are considered like no-nos during pregnancy. Are they going to cause a problem? Are you going to get sick? Probably not, mm-hmm. but there's a risk. So why, why take that risk if it doesn't have um, – a major benefit that you're going to reap. Yeah. Obviously, well, they're putting forth that there is a major benefit. Yeah. We'd argue that the research doesn't agree with that. Mm-hmm. It's probably neutral. Um, and if we're talking about the main nutrients that you would find in milk, we're talking about saturated fat, we're talking about protein. Let's go back again to the the foods and the patterns that are associated with decreased risk of infertility. Um, those are unsaturated fats, mm-hmm. not saturated fats. Mm-hmm. Those are... Uh, plant-based proteins, not animal-based proteins. Mm -hmm. So it's just, it doesn't align with the research. It's potentially risky. Mm -hmm. It's starting to sound like the organ meats again, right? Yes, totally. Like, sure, we want fat and we want protein, but there are other places we can get it from foods that are more aligned with a pro-fertility diet, a healthy pregnancy diet. And Um, better for the environment, too. And better for the environment, (laughs) not to mention. Um, And the cow. Yeah. And And the cow. Specifically, we we covered saturated fat a little bit in regards to fertility, but there's pretty strong data um, in regards to pregnancy that diets high in saturated fat are associated with poor pregnancy outcomes. So a high saturated fat diet is going to be increase your risk of gestational diabetes, increase your risk of preeclampsia. Mm-hmm. Uh, so there's just lots of reasons why these foods aren't, aren't ideal. And what does the research say about plant-based or plant-predominant diets for fertility in particular? Does it Has it studied that much? And is it is it helpful? Is it optimal? 
Yeah, I mean, you know, I I would definitely consider a a Mediterranean type of of dietary pattern, a plant predominant pattern. Um, I think that's also pretty consistent with the quote unquote fertility diet that uh, we keep referencing using nurses health data out of Harvard. So, you know, I think there is pretty strong evidence to show that a plant predominant style dietary pattern is, is likely optimal for fertility. As far as a plant exclusive or a vegan diet, we don't have data to show that it is the best. We don't have data to show that it is maybe even more optimal than a plant predominant diet. Um, we do know that it can be safe. Uh, we do know that it can be effective uh, for, for both fertility and for pregnancy. That is also the statement of the American Academy. I always say American, <laughs> the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. Um, but you know, to say that we actually have specific concrete studies showing that, we just don't currently have that research. Yeah, there's just been no studies on fertility and vegan or vegetarian diets. Can we talk about why too? I mean, I I think this is also really important to understand study design. In, In order to have some type of trial where we say, okay, this group does this, this group does this, we have to be willing to alter one of the controls. And so, you know, especially in women who are trying to become pregnant to say, hey, we're not sure about this. We want to test it. We're not going to put women at risk of things that we're not sure of, that this is absolutely true in pregnancy even more. You know, we're never going to give women raw milk and then not give women raw milk and see what happens. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is just completely unethical. It would never pass a institutional review board. So a lot of the research that we do have when it comes to both fertility and pregnancy is observational in nature. There's obviously going to be, you know, pros and cons with using that kind of data, but I think it's important to say, you know, just because we don't have concrete evidence on this specific thing doesn't mean that we can't see patterns. Um, and especially again, like I was talking about with sort of that plant predominancy. I mean, that that is the common thread throughout the vast majority of fertility research. There is a little bit of research on pregnancy and some and some pregnancy outcomes in regards mm-hmm. to specifically vegan and vegetarian mm-hmm. diets, specifically for preeclampsia. There was one study done on women at the farm. You may have heard of the farm. Yeah. It was a, it's a vegan community in rural mm-hmm. Tennessee um, who follows a very uh, appropriately mm-hmm. planned uh, vegan diet. They are eating basically according to all the guidelines of how you should eat. They're supplementing. Um, so this is a really good group to look at for, for different health outcomes. And out of 775 women, only one had preeclampsia oh. out of the whole. And what's the, the what did you say the state, the average is? I think it's about 10 to maybe 15%. Okay. Um, and also That's I should say lot. too, yeah. preeclampsia is the leading cause of um, both maternal and infant mortality. It is a, it is an issue, yes, in developing uh, or low-income countries as well. It is also definitely a concern here in, in higher-income countries. I mean, it really is, I think, probably one of the, the riskiest concerns when it comes to pregnancy. Um, there's a lot of factors. Diet is just one of them. Age. Um, you know, number of pregnancies. So you tend to have a higher risk the the more babies that you have. Um, if you're carrying twins or triplets, rate goes up. Um, weight can be a factor. So you know, diet is one factor. But yeah, the again the observational research that we do have showing that you know a high fiber vegan diet may be possibly beneficial is. is Yeah, Yeah. and this is not to be confused with like a processed vegan diet because there's so many different ways to eat vegan, right? You can eat uh, Oreos and chips all day (laughs) and vegan burgers, or you can eat whole plant foods with beans and sweet potatoes and lots of avocado and tahini and hemp seeds, lots of hemp seeds. Yeah, (laughs) hemp seeds, hemp seeds. And fruit fruit and vegetables, all that. So so what exactly, to be clear, because we never really preface this, Mm -hmm. what does plant predominant mean mean versus – exclusively plant-based. Yeah. So uh, it, when it comes to fertility, plant predominant can mean th- there's there's no sort of specific defined percentage. Um, really in the research, it's anywhere from 75 to up to 85, maybe even 90% of a whole food plant-based diet with then some allocation for animal foods. I would say if we're talking about the optimal sort of plant predominant fertility diet based on the research and looking at health alone, it would be uh, sort of probably an 85% plant-based whole food diet with then allocation for things like eggs and fish because both of those things have shown to be possibly beneficial not only in pregnant, I mean in fertility, but also in pregnancy. 
pregnancy. Um, again, there are some variations sort of what that specific percentage is, but when we talk about where we currently are in, in sort of this standard American diet, to even just let's say a 75% plant predominant diet, I mean, we're miles apart. Mm -hmm. And so really I think trying to sort of go back to our, our overall ethos, our overall mission is really trying to shift as much as we can to just say, yeah, where, where can we meet, you know, and, and knowing the, the, the benefits that can happen again for all stages of life, but really specifically for fertility and pregnancy to getting people to be, you know, at least 75 plant predominant from there, you know, there's a lot of, I think, nuance and variance in what works individually. And yeah. when you say 75%, does that mean 75% of calories or 75% of the plate? like physical plate because a lot of times people can think, oh yeah, I eat mostly plants. But then when you break it down, it looks like mostly plants. Of calories. Like, yeah, because <laughs> it'll be like, oh, this much of my plate has asparagus you know, again, and this, but most of the calories are coming from meat or yes, dairy and yes. eggs. So we'd you know say of calories. And, and again, it's not a thing yeah. that can necessarily be specifically quantified. When, when we talk about a plant predominant diet, we often talk about how it can look different for different families. The whole idea is a diet based mainly around whole plant foods. And for everyone, that's going to look different for a variety of factors, um, from health conditions to socioeconomic status. Like it, it, it varies a lot. The goal is that we should all be eating more plant foods. Let's all get as close as we can. Let's all reduce our meat intake as much as we can. And we really like this term because it's inclusive. And if we want to meet um, our massive global goals of, of halting climate change, of meeting the UN sustainable um, health goals, we're not going to be able to do this if people are only meeting certain uh, expectations of perfection. So we like to put forth this term and say, take it how it works for you. It's a it's an open door to start exploring a plant-based diet and whatever works for you, and then find where you fall there. Because we want more people eating more plants and less and less meat. And we don't we don't want to exclude anyone because they can't meet a certain ideal. Totally, totally. And I think it's helpful too to explain that in addition to what you just said, the calorie thing, so people can know, okay, where do I start? How do I go there? Instead of replacing your meat with broccoli, that's not gonna work. Like you need yes. the broccoli, but you need to replace the meat with something more calorically dense, mm -hmm. like a calorically dense plant food, like sweet potatoes or beans and things like that. So absolutely, that's which helpful. is where people have missteps yeah. um, when they start plant-based diets, um, is is missing out on these key nutrients and yeah. thinking the diet isn't working for them when really it's just hasn't been appropriately planned. Yeah, well, and especially in both for t uh, in in pregnancy where we we do need higher levels of protein. So we can't just sort of cut out the the traditional sort of meat and then replace it only with, you know, vegetables or, or fruits. We really need to be focusing too on legumes, on, on plant-based proteins, on tofu, on tempeh um, to try to help meet that, that need during pregnancy. Perfect. And what are the key nutrients of focus for pregnancy and also for plant-based considerations? Yeah, I mean, the, the first one to consider is just overall energy intake, calories. Um, needs increase by about 340 calories in the second trimester and about 450 calories in the third trimester. Uh, no one needs to be calorie counting. Uh, this really just sort of looks like maybe additional larger snack or, or mini meal uh, in the second trimester. And then in the third trimester, maybe having larger portions in addition to sort of that, that snack or additional meal to help meet goals. Um, but really, that would be sort of the, the biggest consideration. Um, protein, like I said, you know, 25 grams, um, which is about 70 to 80 grams for the average uh, woman to help meet for, for protein needs. Fat and carbohydrates, they remain about the same as the general population in terms of needs. But for the healthiest pregnancy outcomes, again, you want to be focusing on more whole grain, more fiber-rich carbohydrate sources, and of course, the more unsaturated fatty acids. So the monounsaturated fats that are found in plant foods and um, nuts and seeds, and as well as the polyunsaturated long chain omega-3 fatty acid DHA again, which I think we talked enough yeah. about that mm -hmm. one. Are there any uh, other specific <laughs> supplements you do recommend or don't recommend in pregnancy that you're seeing? Yeah. I mean, the, the, other, the other big nutrient during pregnancy is ensuring adequate intake of folate. 
folic mm -hmm. acid. Uh, this is why one of the recommendations set forth is for women who are thinking about becoming pregnant is to start a prenatal. The big difference between a prenatal and a multivitamin is the fact that a prenatal specifically is probably going to have higher intake levels of folic acid, iodine, and iron to help meet those needs during pregnancy. Um, so the, the reason that we want to really focus on folate, on folic acid, is because um, this is sort of the not getting enough of that nutrient in the first 12 weeks or so of pregnancy. That's when the neural tube forms uh, in the infant and not having enough folate, folic acid can increase risk of something called spina bifida, which is where the, the neural tube doesn't close completely. And because some women do not know they're pregnant until maybe further in when you know the brain, the spinal cord is developing, it might be too late. It's not a nutrient that you could take more of later in pregnancy to correct that. Once it's mm -hmm. it's formed, it's formed. So um, we we do want to ensure adequate intake of, of folate, folic acid. That uh, is a supplement that I took for all of my pregnancies mm -hmm. in the very beginning. My husband used to be a vitamins manager at a health food oh. shop for mm. many years back when we lived in California. So he got like very up in the understanding of yeah. supplements. And he's like, this is one you definitely need to take. It's been like one of the most well-researched yes. supplements yes. for pregnancy. So every single one I took it even though he also said in addition that like plant-based diets are the ones that are the most rich That's in right. folate which is great but yeah. like the added assurance because it is yeah. so strongly associated with strong like good brain development Absolutely. and everything like that if we want to talk about healthy brain development we should be talking about b12 mm -hmm. iron and choline mm -hmm. um, which are all nutrients that we should really focus on during pregnancy for a plant-based diet as we discussed that means b12 should definitely be supplemented not just for exclusively plant-based women research has shown that people following vegetarian and even semi-vegetarian diets may be at risk of mm -hmm. b12 deficiency uh, this also goes for anyone with absorption issues in the stomach someone mm -hmm. who's had gastric bypass surgery or somebody who perhaps is even on PPIs and might not have um, enough stomach acid. Uh, B12 is recommended to be to be supplemented and in a high dose. So um, there's a lot of confusion about how much B12, especially yeah. for plant-based pregnancies, is appropriate. Uh, the absorption of B12 in a single dose goes down with increasing amount. Um, uh -huh. So you can't just take the RDA. It's actually recommended to take about 250 micrograms if you're going to take a single dose. Mm. And most prenatal multivitamins do not contain that amount. Mm. So most people uh, will likely want an additional B12 supplement on top of their mm -hmm. prenatal multivitamin. Yeah, B12 is a really important one for yes. plant-based mm -hmm. pregnancies. Something to consider for people to, to realize too is that the people who are not eating plant-based, they're eating a lot of animal foods, they're also getting supplemented through B12 That's right. because yeah. a lot of these you know, cattle farms are injecting B12 into the cows yeah. as a form of supplementation for them too because they're not getting it from the place that they're supposed to be getting it anymore because totally. of the crane fed. So they're supplementing through the animal yeah. <laughs> essentially. Yeah. Well, it's kind of like DHA, you yeah. know, you're consuming the fish, but the fish consume the microalgae. Yeah, so except this cutting is, out the middleman. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, except for this is like they're literally this is injecting, an intentional, yeah, yeah, injecting yeah, totally. B12 into that. Yeah, and that again goes back to the natural argument about where if you need supplements, it's not natural, but our, our food system is supplemented in so many ways. The main source of vitamin D for most people is dairy and it's or is specifically cow's milk, but it's added to cow's milk. It's not naturally in cow's milk. Mm -hmm. um, iodine is found in dairy because um, it's used in industrial cleaning solutions for dairy equipment. It's also supplemented to cattle. Mm -hmm. um, so, so whether or not you even know that you're being supplemented, Supplemented, you're being supplemented. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and and there are benefits to this. I mean, going back even to like the folic acid argument. I mean, since the introduction of folic acid enrichment in grains and cereals, I mean, there's been a 70 percent reduction in neural tube defects uh, in wow. the United States. I mean, those these these are big public health wins. Iodized salt, you know, dairy containing iodine has also been really helpful for overall cognition, cognition especially in children. I mean. Again, sort of, it's like we don't live these natural, quote unquote, lives uh, as much anymore. And so some of these public health programs have really had huge wins. And so to say things like supplements are bad or, you know, you don't need them, it's just sort of a, a really naive look and not a, a critical look of the history of the benefit of these programs. Mm -hmm or the mass majority of the population. Yes. And are there some good ways to increase your minerals and nutrients through pregnancy specifically? Like what advice do you have for people through Whole Foods? Yeah, we, we make joke. every bite count. Yeah. 
Oh, oh yeah. You can share the joke. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, I feel like my, my uh, I don't know what the right word is, but uh, I, I kind of think of pregnant women the same way I think of picky eaters. Mm. You know, it's sort of like trying to get as creative as possible and really maximizing nutrition in every bite. You I know, love that. Especially, <laughs> especially with women who, you know, may have, pregnancy is a weird, funky time, you know, like you might have morning sickness, you might not feel great, you might feel amazing certain times. I mean, it's, you know, really sort of this, um, it can be a, a different state for a lot of people. And so I think, you know, trying to, to maximize nutrition, um, we love smoothies. Uh, one, it's a great way to use things like a fortified milk, which will help with calcium and vitamin D. You can add in lots of beautiful fruits and vegetables. You can add in nut butters to help get in some fat, to help get in adequate calories and protein. So this is where a great thing seeds come in. I mean, I feel like I drink a smoothie often uh, during pregnancy just because it was such an easy way to get a concentrated source of calories in. Leafy greens, you know, it can be a lot sometimes to eat a big salad, which is a great sort of technique for overall satiety and weight management. But when it comes to pregnancy and we're really trying to sort of maximize intake, uh, cooking them can be a great way. You know, if anyone's ever cooked spinach or kale, you know you take this to nothing, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> when all the, the water takes out. And that can be, again, a really nice way to get a dense source of, um, of vegetables in. Do a lot of energy balls with nuts and seeds and chickpeas. We have our bean-based PBJ mm -hmm. balls um, on our website that were originally created for kids, but that we loved, like both for po postpartum and during pregnancy. Mm -hmm. um, it's really about yeah, trying to maximize nutrition um, with every bite. Yeah. yeah, we make a yogurt with like fruit and cashews and yogurt. I mean, and I'm um, tofu. Putting oh. nuts and vegetables into sauces, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of the plant-based cheese sauces are a great way to get in like some cashews yeah. or pestos where you can get in different nuts and seeds and then the leafy greens, which may not be as appealing when you're not feeling uh -huh. well. Yeah, I add like uh, white beans and cashews to like even like a jar of tomato sauce and puree that up for a nice mm -hmm. like hearty protein rich, mm -hmm. uh, yummy fatty sauce. Yeah, I think that creativity is the key. Like when you're pregnant and things can taste different, you That's always right. want to just be creative and nourish yourself in the way that you best know how. See what's available to you, what sounds good in the moment. Mm -hmm. Look up a new recipe with that ingredient that you know so that sounds good. How can I increase the protein? How can I increase the healthy fats in there? And getting sufficient calories yeah. can mean less about eating like three big meals a day like you did when you weren't pregnant and more about eating smaller meals more often. Mm -hmm. That can be really helpful for women mm -hmm. a lot of times. Like, mm -hmm. okay, I'm only, I only ate maybe half the amount that I would when I'm not pregnant for this breakfast. That means I need second breakfast yeah. <laughs> Just, yeah. well. A and that's a good later. tip for morning sickness too, mm -hmm. is yeah. that eating small frequent meals mm -hmm. uh, works a lot better for people who are nauseous because being too hungry or too full can yeah. both contribute to nausea. Yeah. And yeah. when that baby gets bigger, I mean, I feel like towards the end too, I was like, <laughs> I don't have room. Like yeah. I can't eat a big meal, but yeah. I was hungry. And, yeah. you know, sort of that grazing constantly throughout the day is also a good way to yeah. stay nourished. And this is really about abundance to me. Right. I feel like so often it can be about what don't I eat? What do I have to restrict? Mm -hmm. But really that's what's so beautiful about this way of including the vibrant whole plant foods and eating until you're totally satisfied and eating lots of fresh fruit. Like mm -hmm. there's so much demonization in the world of in society about like yeah. don't eat fruit because of sugar, but fruit is so, so, so yes. vital for yeah. us. It gives us energy and it tastes so delicious. It's so natural for us going back to the nature thing. Yeah. It's, it's like obviously a yeah. human food, like well, the we most have a obvious. We biological preference for sweetness mm -hmm. and that's really probably because of fruits, because yeah. fruits were a nutrient-dense source of both energy yeah. and vitamins in the diet, and humans seek it out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What about, okay, this is a good question to segue <laughs> about fruit, is fruit and gestational diabetes. A lot of times people are thinking, oh, I'm, you know, I have gestational diabetes. I'm told by my doctor I have to limit fruit and yeah. not eat fruit at all or whatever. What are, what are your thoughts, and how do you go about that? So there's no really solid research showing that one specific diet is actually better than another for the treatment of gestational diabetes. Carbohydrate uh, management and eating a consistent amount is important for both gestational diabetes and um, diabetes outside of pregnancy, um, but you don't need to limit your carbohydrate intake. And some of the research has actually shown that people who are consuming a higher carbohydrate diet compared to a lower carbohydrate diet, women, um, actually have better management of gestational diabetes because they have better insulin management. So it's not about cutting out these high carbohydrate foods, high sugar foods like fruit, it's about um, choosing 
the less refined ones that are going to help you manage your blood sugar better. And in fact, a lot of the nutrients that are found in fruits are not things that we would want to limit. Mm -hmm. These are things that promote overall health and we want more of in our diet. Antioxidants. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. These are things that are... Um, that are seen in opposition to some of these health conditions. Mm -hmm. So it's about eating the fruit versus the fruit juice. It's about making the smoothie versus the fruit juice if you have gestational diabetes. Mm -hmm. If you don't have gestational diabetes, then you can certainly have a fruit juice and your blood sugar will rise and it will come back down just mm -hmm. like um, it's supposed just to. Like it's supposed to. Yeah. And so much demonization these days of blood mm. sugar and like people are suggesting that your blood sugar needs to be like mm. flatlining, which is just not the way the body is designed to work and shows a complete lack of understanding about physiology. So focusing on those whole grains, the fiber rich fruits and vegetables, these are all things that are that are great for gestational diabetes. There also isn't a consensus of sort of, you know, the best diet for gestational diabetes. The American Diabetes Association sort of just says, you know, again, like Whitney said, focusing on all these foods. So even this concept that women who are diagnosed with uh, gestational diabetes suddenly need to follow a low carbohydrate diet is not aligned mm. uh, with research. And also that can be a really stressful thing. And there oh, is research to talk about this all of a sudden because, you know, you're normally diagnosed later in pregnancy. It's usually around 26 weeks. To suddenly have to shift the diet, the stress of that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, you know, there's, there is research especially showing, you know, about stress in pregnancy and the, the negative effects it can have. And so this, this idea that suddenly women have to, you know, cut out all grains or cut out fruit and start, you know, ramping up the protein is not only not aligned with what is, is considered to be the best source of evidence at this time, but also a really stressful, impactful thing. And then one sort of quick thing I'll just sort of say, because you mentioned, I know before, like, you know, your doctor saying this, most doctors do not have a lot of nutrition training. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that is something that we are constantly talking about and trying to educate on too, because I think for a lot of women we do, we turn to our midwives during pregnancy, we turn to doctors and, and not everyone is the same. You know, people can always go get additional training, but they don't always tend to be the the most up to date source of nutrition information. Yeah, yeah. that's super important to preface because yeah. there's a lot of fear. Of like, oh no, my doctor said this. Absolutely. But a lot of times, you know, if you question, okay, well, where did you get that information? They won't really have the answer for that. Absolutely, and we have a lot of physician friends who will who will attest to that, that mm -hmm. they didn't receive that kind of training in their program. So it, the onus is on them to go get additional training and not go, everybody does yeah, that. Yeah, they had to go outside. Uh, outside of their go. traditional medical training. Yeah, actually, um, this is why Alex and I partnered with Dr. Reshma Shah. Um, she co-authored the book, Nourish, the Definitive oh, I Guide guess I've heard of that book. to Plant-Based Nutrition. Right. Yeah, and we're going to be... I think in the next few weeks releasing a course for health professionals on pediatric nutrition walking them all the way through from fertility through teenage years um, because it's just that information just isn't out there that's everybody. amazing that's mm -hmm. so needed and so helpful yeah well and and hopefully to empower you know more health more health practitioners to to feel really confident about these sort of plant predominant diets and also to help people who do choose to be plant exclusive or vegan in their pregnancies uh, or fertility to sort of know like oh yeah there there are so many benefits in doing this and here are some considerations because we and it's evidence based that's right yeah <laughs> which is the most important part. Yeah. Yeah. yeah because yeah. especially if you don't if you haven't looked into the research then all you hear is kind of the noise in the nutrition mm -hmm. space and you may buy into some of these myths. And once you can actually look at the literature and see how uh, plant-based diets are supported by the literature and actually in line mm -hmm. with most health organizations' recommendations for dietary patterns, mm -hmm. physicians can feel a lot yeah. more confident and be prepared how to appropriately counsel the yeah. patients in these topics. This is a really important part to mention, like you said about the noise, because anecdotes are really powerful. Yes. But a lot of people, like you really have to think about how anecdotes, a lot of times, have you ever had a time in your life where you thought, oh, this particular thing helped this thing. And then later you realized, oh, wait, it wasn't that. It was this thing. Like mm -hmm. some, some other evidence mm -hmm. came into play for your life and you realized, oh, it actually wasn't that that helped me in whatever area of health. It was actually something else. So and then there's also the placebo effect and how powerful sure. yes. that is. That's why in science they have to use the placebo effect because the mind is so powerful. Yeah. So you can't just take an anecdote 
here or there, here or there, and then accumulate what you think is evidence. It has to be well medicated. Okay. There well, are certainly research. limits to research, yeah. but there are reasons that we rely on it because yeah. it's the best available yeah. evidence. Like you said, the the common um, the common fault with these anecdotes is that is attributing a treatment effect mm -hmm. to something when it was really uh, something could have been else. Something there was a else. confounding right. variable. Yeah, yeah, it could have been something and else. And so people feel better. When they eat pretty much any type of diet, doesn't matter what kind of diet you go on, people initially do feel better. They often lose weight. And that's likely because of all of the things that they're getting rid of, all the poor health habits. They may also uh, partner their new diet with exercise, with better sleep. They're on a whole health kick. Mm -hmm. So it's like, is it, natu is it necessarily the specific new way you're eating? Is it the foods you're restricting or the foods um, that you've added in? We can't say. Because or is this it wasn't, some other factor? Or is it some other factor? Even food yeah, related. we can't because you're not measuring that. Yeah. So, so back to gestational diabetes. A lot of research on dietary patterns of specific nutrients. Um, so there was one great study, I think it was also out of Harvard. Mm -hmm correct me if I'm wrong, it showed that adding just five grams of fiber to the diet, specifically from whole grains or from fruits, demonized for gestational diabetes, actually reduced the risk of gestational diabetes by 23 and 26 percent, mm. um, respectively. So these two foods that people are yeah. like, grains, fruit, you have yeah. to limit those yeah. if you don't want to get gestational diabetes, or if you have it, you should limit them. Mm -hmm. And in fact, these foods are associated with better health outcomes, less risk of gestational diabetes, primarily because of the things that they contain. So again, while we can't say the specific diet is it uh, necessarily prevents or treats, we can say that the foods within this diet have been shown to either prevent uh, reduce the likelihood of or help contribute to better blood sugar management. And awesome. the reminder that only plant foods contain fiber. So when we're talking about where do we consume a high fiber diet, it has to be a diet rich in plant foods. Mm -hmm. And you probably covered this extensively with Dr. B, but <laughs> it's know. just like that's where some of these communities that exclude a lot of things like grains and, and fruits and vegetables, it's like, what are you losing here? When you cut that out, you're, you're losing a major nutrient mm -hmm. that's associated with mm -hmm. good health in, in so many different areas of nutrition and mm -hmm. so many different populations. Yeah. Dr. B had said very clearly on our episodes how fiber isn't sexy. When people, <laughs> when people hear fiber- I think he might be making it sexy. Yeah, I was going to say, he's bringing, he's bringing sexy fiber back. I think he is. He's done a very good job at it. <laughs> definitely has. He talks about how like, you know, when people hear fiber, they think like fiber supplements or salt, yeah. like these think like powders. Metamucil. They think of powder <laughs> from like a grandma and yeah, they're not yeah. realizing like it's fiber from whole plant foods. Mm -hmm. Yes. And how that is so great for your digestion and all different, lowering yeah. your risk for all these different things that you're talking about. I mean, we won't dive it into, dive into it very extensively, but uh, we're just on the tip of the iceberg of exploring how the microbiome can affect different prenatal mm -hmm. and postnatal outcomes, mm -hmm. things like um, uh, postpartum depression. So, and we know that fiber is what fuels the microbiome. Yeah. So there's so many things that we don't even completely understand yet about nutrition, yeah. but we know at least we have this base of knowledge, understanding that these foods are currently yeah. associated with, with yeah. good health. Yeah, it's for, likely that they yeah. also benefit these other things yeah. as well. For anybody interested in listening to those episodes, check out Dr. Will Bolsowitz on my podcast. We did two episodes on gut health. They were so great. He's so awesome. Yeah. Shout out to Dr. B. We love him. <laughs> okay, so we're kind of coming to the end of like specifics on fertility and pregnancy I want to talk about. And the beauty of this is all this stuff that's related to fertility is also – with health, like related to healthy pregnancy. That's right. That's what's so great. They're not separate. They're yeah, all, absolutely. it's all like a holistic approach. Yeah. You don't have to switch your diet the moment you become pregnant. Yeah. Everything that's going to help you become pregnant is also going to help you have the healthiest pregnancy. That's amazing. Yeah. And, and a lot of these things also apply to what's healthy for, for children mm -hmm. as well mm -hmm. in the postpartum period and going on to mm -hmm. um, early childhood. Yes. Amazing. Okay. So I want to talk about iron deficiency. Mm -hmm. There's, you know, there's a lot to talk about there. And there's something I'm seeing come up a lot in the, and again, the ancestral world, because this is like a really trendy thing right sure. now. It's, and, you know, someone might say, how could ancestral be trendy? But it really is becoming a trend. It, it's like a very, it's kind of the thing right now. Mm -hmm. you know, for a while it was paleo, then it was keto. And now it's like nourishing traditions, ancestral. Actually, no, I think after, after keto, then it was plant-based and now that's not as hot anymore. <laughs> and now it's, you know, and it's just, Trends just come and go, and right yeah. now it's ancestral stuff. And mm -hmm. I don't want to give it too much weight, but there's just a lot of anecdotes there. And so people are really interested in, like, what does maybe a plant-based 
you know, physician or dietitian have to say. So specifically about iron deficiency, there, there's this talk that it's not actually something that you need to increase your iron if you have iron deficiency. It's actually more about um, about your copper and getting uh, enough uh, retinol, which you were talking about the problems there, um, and helping increase your copper, which will help your iron absorption and not to take iron supplements, saying that that's actually harmful to take iron supplements in pregnancy. What are your thoughts? I mean, well, so, so first let's just look at the data. Um, regardless of dietary pattern, so whether you're vegetarian, vegan, omnivorous, uh, iron deficiency is the most common deficiency. Uh, that's true for both adults and children. Uh, in pregnancy, like I said before, it tends to sort of trend uh, the, the, the further you get along uh, in your pregnancy. So uh, we know from NHANES data, about 30% uh, of women, again, regardless of diet, are iron deficient. Copper is not uh, a nutrient of concern, uh, regardless of diet. We don't see uh, widespread deficiencies in copper. Um, we, we really don't see widespread deficiencies in, in retinol. Um, and so this, this idea that we would need to increase both of those when we, we know that there is a true deficiency in iron, especially in late pregnancy, um, I think really ignores sort of where, where current science is. Yeah, iron needs are extremely high during pregnancy. They go up to 27 milligrams for an average diet, and if you're following a plant-based diet, it's recommended to get 1.8 times the RDA, so that's up to 48 milligrams of iron a day. That's a large, large amount. Uh, the vast majority of people do not get that, the vast majority of women, um, which is why iron is a priority nutrient in multivitamin supplements and why, like Alex said, so many women experience iron deficiency. It's not because they're not absorbing the iron, it's because they're not consuming the iron mm. because it is hard to get that much iron from whole foods. The reason this matters is because, especially when it comes to late pregnancy, being anemic increases your risk of hemorrhaging uh, during childbirth. And also the third trimester is when the, the baby is able to really ramp up their iron stores, which is supposed to last them for the next four to six months once they're born. So it's amazing. Yeah, it, it is amazing. And it's why the body is so sort of finely tuned to really ensure that we are trying to maximize iron intake, uh, during pregnancy. So we're able to support the infant afterwards. And telling women that they shouldn't be taking iron supplements when we have, again, very strong data that iron supplementation is extremely helpful when it comes to raising iron in the body and that they need to be increasing copper uh, instead, which again is not a nutrient that we see a deficiency in. It, it, it just can lead to adverse health effects for both mom and for baby. Um, the other thing I'll say too is that there are two different types of iron. So there is heme iron, uh, which is predominantly found in animal-based sources, and then non-heme iron, uh, which is found in, in plant-based sources. And the body has a really good way of regulating iron uptake from non-heme sources. So what that means is, let's say you're taking um, uh, an, an abundance of non-heme iron in through your diet and you don't need it, then your body is able to easily excrete it. It's not quite the same with heme iron. Uh, your body uptakes much more heme iron, which is why when we see risk of excess iron or iron overload, it's not from non-heme sources, it's from heme sources. That's interesting. That kind of goes against the opposite of what they're saying. They're basically mm -hmm. saying iron supplementation, which is plant-based iron, is going to cause all this overload, but you're actually saying that mm -hmm. our body recycles that well, yeah. and it's the animal-based iron that's actually causing overload if you have too much of it. Yeah. The, yeah, the only time that we're really concerned about um, iron intake from supplementation is acute toxicity. You know, let's say that you suddenly took 15 of your iron pills at once mm -hmm. and you're getting in 400 milligrams of iron. That would be problematic because yeah. it's going to override your body's ability to sort of regulate that. But if you're taking a prenatal with 18 milligrams of iron and you're consuming an iron rich diet that is primarily from non-heme sources, you're not going to have a risk of excess iron. Hmm. Any other thoughts on that, Whitney? I think that pretty much sums it up. I just think this is yet another thing in the so-called ancestral community that just has no evidence to back it up.
Hmm. Where is this? It's true. From? I look it up, and where is this? Like if from? I if I Google it, I Google this, and I cannot find anything. On yeah, it. it's on Instagram. It's yeah. on these posts with pictures and captions. But when I Google it, there is nothing. Like I page after page, I like can't find yeah. that information. I'm like, where can I look up what they're saying? And it's like it's nowhere. And that's the problem with this stuff is that the onus of proof somehow lies on the people who didn't make the claim to prove that that claim is untrue. Mm. When the people making the claims, they don't have to put forth any evidence they just say the claim and then they say look at me so and true. I look healthy and mm -hmm. you're so, so we're over true. here being like how can I even just prove this claim because I don't know where it came from mm. I don't know what it's based on That's well so and it, it, it appeals to nature again you know to to tell someone oh supplements yeah supplements feel like it's it goes against what I'm supposed to be doing so it's like it, it buys into that fear emotion when we talk about like anecdotes like, oh, that must make sense because they're they're saying that supplements are bad and that makes sense to me because it's an additional thing to have when it's just, again, not in line with – I do research. have something to add that if um, – if the problem was with the absorption due to a lack of retinol or copper um, – then we should see much lower rates of iron deficiency in omnivorous populations mm. that are eating a lot of meat, mm. um, which is a good source of iron, which consequently, consequently comes um, packaged with retinol. So mm. retinol is found in animal products. So is iron. So is, um, it, so is copper. So if all of these things were um, the ideal way to take in iron and in the most optimal form, then why are we seeing high rates of iron deficiency in populations that have a high intake of these foods? That's a really good point because it's really not like – It's not an absorption issue. It's an issue of yeah. people not eating enough iron. Yeah. And and I don't want to – Not eating enough plant-based iron or just any, any iron. iron? Any iron. A lot of, um, you know – a lot of people um, are just not consuming, like even omnivores aren't necessarily always consuming um, tons of iron-rich iron foods. Hmm. Yeah, so. if you were eating a diet rich in, in poultry and in eggs and in dairy, it could be really iron deficient. I mean, those aren't, those aren't yeah. iron-rich animal foods. I also don't want to discount discount the fact that um, when you are eating a diet comprised mainly of non-heme plant-based iron sources, like we said before, the RDA is increased due to mm -hmm. the fact that non-heme iron has a lower absorption rate. And again, like Alex said, that is a good thing for us. It's in order to prevent iron overload. Mm. It's a highly orchestrated system to make sure we're getting the right amount of iron. But to, especially during this time of extremely increased iron needs, and really we say for any plant-based dieters, um, you want to try to enhance your non-heme iron consumption. So to do that, you can consume iron-rich foods with a source of vitamin C, which can increase the absorption of iron by four to six times. Mm -hmm. I think you've heard this on other yeah. podcasts. You've talked about it on other podcasts as well, but this can happen really naturally. Mm -hmm. You know, you're pairing fruits and vegetables with um, your uh, iron rich foods like the legumes, the whole grains, the nuts and seeds. So this can happen in your smoothies. This can happen in your bean based tacos where you've got some bell pepper going. Uh, it doesn't have to be a difficult thing. It often happens mm -hmm. naturally in the context of many diets and especially cultural diets around the world. Mm -hmm. And that could be lemon squeezed on your green salad. Totally. All, so, something super simple like that. Totally. Too. Or even your steamed greens, like you said, squeezing lemon on top with mm -hmm. some salt yeah. and pepper. Mm -hmm. You've got your tofu and a stir fry and you've got some lime juice in there. Yeah. So. And if you're taking high amounts of iron and your iron levels are not going up, then, you know, I wouldn't think, oh, it's copper or it's retinol. I would probably think celiac disease or maybe some other um, gut issue where you're not able to actually uptake the iron. Hmm. Yeah. And then looking factors there, how yes. to help that type of area. Yeah. Super interesting. <laughs> well, to kind of round it out, it can be a little bit confusing. All the, all this like nutrition jargon like the supplements and the, mm. the nutrients and, and so it can just be a little confusing I think when you're like okay I just want to eat well I just want to feel abundance and not restrictive what are the final takeaways for women who are looking for optimal pregnancy achievement and healthy pregnancies let's just like break it down simply for that as we end it here yeah my okay. favorite simple catchphrase for nutrition is from Michael Pollan it's eat 
whole foods, mostly plants. Mm -hmm. It's very simple. You want to add in the plant predominant aspect and say, do whatever works for you within that context. Um, making sure that you're doing that and meeting essential nutrient needs is all you really need to make sure you're eating a healthy diet, not just in pregnancy, uh, but in any any course, of, any part of your life. Love it. Life cycle. Yeah. Do you have anything? Concur. To I mean, say? I yeah, I, I I think it's sort of this this common refrain we keep saying: eat as as many whole food, plant based uh, items as you can. Uh, if you're plant exclusive, ensure that you have adequate intake of uh, vitamin D and B12 and possibly DHA. And uh, from there, you know, I think that you'll you'll meet a lot of needs. You'll cover a lot and of needs. Round it back into the abundance perspective. Think mm -hmm. about what can I add to my plate today to make it more nutrient dense versus what do I think I need to restrict? Perfect. Love that. This is so amazing. <laughs> Thank I you so much. love you guys. <laughs> I, I wish you guys could stay here for a whole week. So we um, can, like, maybe too. Our, our families do not. <laughs> you know, they're like, come back home. You're like, I'm going to like, stay. We're never home. coming home. Yeah. We're staying in Hawaii. We're sending all these yeah. photos of us around, like, you know, rainbows and everything. Well, and everyone's like, great. Well, we're working. Kids yeah. are at school. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Your husband's like, when's my Hawaii uh -huh, trip? Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> I'm going to come on the Ellen Fisher podcast next. <laughs> all right. Well, thanks for being here. And thanks, everyone, for tuning in. We'll see you next time.